I'm sorry to ruin your night, Phil. <laughs> That's just a so, awful, awful story. That's we've been doing it for seven years for free. Seven years. God bless both of you. One more time for free. It's amazing. But it's not just our time for free. If a witness or a photocopy or whatever, or a hotel or whatever, this comes out of our personal money. Wow. But I do it a hundred times over and he'd do it a thousand times over. Every morning, he wakes to give up. you an idea, yeah. I start my day, I go to the computer, I have my coffee and my oatmeal, and uh, I pull up the arrest records for Calaveras County from the previous day, for Tuolumne County, for Amador County. And I look for anyone who might possibly fit the description. Welcome to Cities and Blood Podcast. Appreciate you both joining us. And uh, just to let all the viewers know, uh, we're going to be talking about the Isaiah, the Isaiah Fowler case. Uh, and this was a case, this was 2015 when this happened? Or was no, the, uh, the crime happened in 2013, May of 2013. 2013. 2013 and we went to trial in 2015. Tri Two first trial was 2015. Okay. For the first time. We went no, back no. again in 2017. Now, just to, to, to run it down for everybody real quick, this, this was a 12-year-old boy who was accused of murdering his 8-year-old younger sister. And uh, that's yeah, all so, I'm going to say, and I'm going to let you guys tell the story because you're intimately involved. For the record, Mark, you were, you were the defending attorney for Isaiah, right? Oh, yeah, from the very beginning. From the very beginning for both so, trials? Okay. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Awesome. So it, it's, it, takes place in, in, it takes place in early May of 2013 out in rural, okay, rural um, Valley Springs, California, in Calaveras County, and it's a Saturday morning, and there's a family of about eight altogether, I think, and this, these two, the brother and sister, he's 12, she's eight, they are 100%, uh, you know, brother and sister, not stepbrothers or anything, and the father and his current wife at the time took all the other kids to Little League game, only five minutes away, you know, and it's a beautiful Saturday morning, and at the last minute, they're leaving, and they, the little girl, the eight-year-old says, I don't want to go. I want to stay here and play, and I don't want to go and sit up and watch the Little League and run around and, you know, do nothing. So I don't want to go to Little League today because they're there all, you know, they were going to be there for several hours. So they said, hold on, let me see if your bigger brother, who's 12. So they go, wake him up. And he says, what? You know, it's 7 in the morning. What? And they say, we're going to go to Little League, but Layla doesn't want to go, okay? She wants to stay here. So you want to stay here and watch her? And he's like yeah sure whatever and he rolls back over because you know he doesn't care he doesn't want to go to little league and he, he's a 12 year old boy he'd like to sleep until about two in the afternoon like most 12 year old boys so that's about it so that day they get a phone call a couple of phone calls come from in the house uh from layla who says isaiah is still sleeping and she says the mom says the stepmother says wake him up and then he calls in and he says hey uh, she's got a headache uh what should i do and they say give her some tylenol says okay and it's a short while later that uh, he calls and he's in a panic and he says there's, you know, there was an intruder in the house and he was hitting Layla. And they said, oh, my God. And they called 911 and they come racing home. They come racing home and uh, they run in and he's still on the phone. The boy, the 12 year old or client Isaiah is still on the phone with 911. Long conversation that's recorded, obviously, with 911. And um they come running in, they grab the father, Barney grabs her, runs out to the porch. And by then the police are there. They say, set her down. And the ambulance comes and, you know, they take her to the hospital. A few hours later, they declare her dead. Uh, from the very beginning, the police considered Isaiah home alone with her to be the suspect. Uh, they interviewed him twice. They interviewed him twice that day, specifically once down at the station with the um, hidden glass wall. So he has no idea they're watching him. You've got the the DA and several others in there. And then you've got the officers in the room with him, interviewing him, trying to, and, and repeating this, repeating his story back and forth to try to get him to both affirm some things that they think helps them and to try to get him confused and to cross things up so they could say, wow, we got an inconsistency. So that was the goal. Was, was his father or an attorney with him? Oh, no, no, no. His father he was, was by himself. Yeah, he was, well, it, no, it, he was by himself at times and at times his father was there. And they did everything they could to keep the father out of there. That's the last thing they wanted was any kind of, you know, any kind of support for him. 
And so, you know, the, the, to speed things along, they, they went home that day, but they were convinced it's him. And about two weeks later, they did a couple of more interviews kind of against his will. Um, and two weeks later, they were really ready to pounce on him and pin it on him. And they had a, a series of long interviews that day, uh, many interviews you know, on it in one day, several hours. And at the very end, with his father sitting there berating him, saying, look, they know you did it. They're going to pin this on you. You know, they're being honest. They can't lie to you. And you have to trust them, son. And I'm your dad. OK, and you kill, you know, the daughter is my daughter. And so the dad basically says, look, you know, he says to the son, he says, you know, I don't I hate the police. I hate cops. And, you know, that son. But this is the time I'm telling you, these guys are not lying to you. OK, well, what has happened was for the last four hours, they've lied to you. They said, just so you know, we've got scientific evidence. You watch TV. You're no fool. You know what DNA evidence is. We've got DNA. We've got this evidence. And then we canvass the neighborhood. And everybody didn't see the suspect you gave us. That was a lie. So they listed all of these things that closed the ring around him, okay, and said, there's no possibility you didn't murder her, okay? And the dad says, son, they can't lie to you, you know, and I'm your dad. And so the kid says, okay. And they start talking about, you know, like, not necessarily the death penalty, but, you know, they can't help him unless he needs help. So if he says that he did this and he needs help, then you get help. And they somewhat imply that all you got to do is tell us you did it because you're sick and everything's okay. He's 12, okay? Remember, if you dial these years back, usually by nine, you still believe in the gosh darn Easter bunny, okay? So this is a guy says, okay, so if I, so he basically says, I guess I did it, but I don't remember doing it. But if you're telling me I did, I guess I did, but I, I don't think I did. And then he goes, I didn't do it. And they say, okay, that's it. You admitted it. And they let him stand up. He hugs his dad and his dad, he says to his dad, I didn't do it. His dad says, I know you didn't, son. They say, well, we've got our confession. So they arrest him. They announce they've arrested him. And, um, you know, we go to litigate it. And um, I, I'll tell, tell you a couple of things about it that is striking to me. And then John knows much more of the intimate details and the current state of DNA evidence. But to me, just, um, you know, from doing this for 30 years, um, I've never seen the perfect crime committed. The reason is, is because it's really hard, okay? And here's a 12-year-old. So they, they, they seized all of it. They took all of his electronic devices, right? And they searched them. And, and there's absolutely nothing in there on how to clean up things, you know, this, that, and the other thing. You know, how do you commit a murder or how do you, whatever. This is a gal who, a little girl who was stabbed 22 times. Um, there's blood all over the room and so forth. There's a variety of reasons that the, the actual murderer would be covered in blood. Okay. Because it's impossible to do that unless you are covered in blood. Okay. And there's zero evidence at all that this kid cleaned up anything up. They took the traps. They took all the traps and the pipes and the drains from every sink, shower, bathroom, tub in that house. And they were perfectly, perfectly missing any blood from this girl or any attempt of a cleanup. It had normal stuff in there, okay? It, there was no cleaning product, no bleach or whatever. And and also, it's just what you would find, but there's no blood from her. So you think, hmm, well, he couldn't have washed himself off in the house. There's no cleanup. There's none. His fingers had grime under the fingernail because this is 12-year-old boy who lives on the country, okay? <laughs> His hands were dirty. You know, he, he didn't wash off, up, you understand? And so... They searched everywhere and there's nothing they could pin on him, put it on him. And after 30 years, I'll tell you these two things I was getting at is if you can't get a 12 year old to confess after two weeks of squeezing them, okay, it's because they didn't do it. Okay. Secondly, in the in the long pantheon of those who are horrid at cleaning up a murder scene in a small discreet area like a house. In the pantheon of people that are capable of doing that, a 12-year-old boy is at the bottom of the list, unfortunately, okay? You bring in Harvey Keitel, the fixer, to come in and clean your house when there's a murder like that. <laughs> Blood everywhere in the horror room, right? Still in my life. You got no Harvey Keitel coming and doing it, right? Yeah. You got nothing. You got no time to do it. We proved in the trial um, that John may get into also that was great. We proved at the last minute that the coroner, who was their witness, had to say, you know what? I have to agree with you. I think the stabbing took place like minutes, you know, minutes before the, before the cops got there, minutes before the dad got home. 
I think the you know the stabbing took place when the boy said it it happened. You know five you know five minutes before the parents got home. And my point is, if you if you, if you give Harvey Keitel five minutes, he can't clean that house. A twelve year old boy can't clean a murder scene that is this type of a murder scene where there's blood everywhere. So he doesn't really make a statement which makes him guilty in any way. Additionally, honestly, there's no physical evidence linking him to it. It is the craziest case, though, because her blood is underneath a steak knife that is in the house. If you take the, the if you take the handle part underneath it, is some of her blood. And the mother says there's no way that could have happened. She was eight, and I would have known her if she got hurt earlier. So whether that was the murder weapon or, or not is also really in of significant dispute. So it has got a couple of facts that float around and are toxic to any explanation uh, of certainty of what happened. And that's one of them, all right? So you get tried in California if you're under 14 when you commit a crime like this, you do not get a jury. You do not get a jury. So he was 12 when this happened, but 15 by the time he went to trial. And he doesn't get a jury. We get a judge. And the judge can hear all the evidence. And at the end, the judge can literally flip a coin. The judge can just say, yeah, I'm done. I'm ready. Guilty. And that's what happened. And we won it on appeal. And they gave us another trial. We tried a different judge, uh, a much worse judge. And that judge just said, yeah, guilty. They don't have to give you a reason why. They don't Actually, have to. if I can jump yeah. in. The second judge learned from the mistake Right. I'm going to say, call it a mistake. From her standpoint, it was a yeah. mistake of the first judge. The first judge gave reasons for why he found Isaiah uh, guilty. And those reasons included the statements that Mark was telling you about, the interviews and statements that were made, uh, several of which were deemed eventually to be inadmissible. And because he said he relied on those, that was the reason for the first this, uh, if winning the first appeal and getting a second trial. Look, real quickly, the kids, the, 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 so they asked the young man the story. They said, well, um, he said, well, there's no dispute. There's a phone record, right, at 1045 in the morning where he calls. The phone record shows he calls the stepmother and he says, uh, Layla has a headache. What should I do? You know? And they said, give her a, he says she's bored. I'm sorry, she's bored. What should I do? And they said, I don't know, put on a movie. He says, okay. So he gets off the phone. But there's a phone call from 1045 from the phone in the house to the stepmother at the baseball field at 10.45 a.m. And she says that day to the police, he asked me, what should I do? I said, if she's bored, put on her movie. And the boy, when he was interviewed, he said, uh, she was bored, so my mom, stepmom said to put on a movie. They said, what'd you do? He said, I put on a movie. What movie? He said, how to eat fried worms. It's her favorite, okay? It is um, an hour and, it is an hour and I think, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, 15 minutes. So as a result, if he puts it on at 1045, that gets him to when it ends, okay? It gets about five minutes to noon. Okay. So, I mean, he's a pretty smart kid if you figure this out in advance. So when they, they interview him, they say, what happened? He says, I put on the movie. The movie ended. We watched it all the way through. I took it out of the DVD. I rewound it and I put it up on the shelf. Then I went to the bathroom. Then what happened? You know, I heard somebody in the house screaming and, you know, saying, hey, come on out. I know you're in here banging on the walls. And then, you know, he says he peeked through the, the bathroom door and he saw someone hitting Layla. And he said someone hitting Layla. And then he comes out and the person ran out of the room, ran out of the room, and ran out of the house. So if you look at that call at 1045 and then you talk to the mother, you know, at, at, when she comes home at 1205 or the husband come home and they're interviewed, they say, what did you tell him? We told him to put on a movie. And then you see him and you interview him as you're the cops. And he says, I put on this movie and it's, you know, 75 minutes or whatever it was. It was like 75 minutes, roughly. That's a pretty good story because his story is afterwards. That's when this, this happens. So we put the, the coroner testifies for the people, for the prosecution. And for the longest time, he had said, you know, he thought maybe the time of death could have been earlier. But during the trial, after cross-examination and shows of documents, he said, wow. I think the time of death, I think the stabbing took place around, oh, I'd say 11.50, uh, 12 o'clock, which is perfect for the boy's story, which he couldn't have rehearsed from a step with his stepmother. He couldn't have rehearsed with his father 
Okay, so you lock those together so tightly, so securely. So his story is perfect. What happened? They watched this movie, and then that's when this intruder breaks in. He was in the bathroom, says the intruder broke in. Well, the intruder was in the house once he's in the bathroom and does the murder. And so if you have no, you know, look, if you have no time between, if you have no time to do any cleanup because the time of death is shortly before the police get there and you're a 12-year-old boy, you didn't do it. All right. There's in the trial, the, the prosecution's expert, the DOJ expert on crime scene reconstruction admitted, okay, that the murderer would have to be covered in blood. The murderer would have to have blood on their eyebrows, would have it in their nostrils, would have it in their ears, would have it in their hair, would have it in their, you know, fingernails. There's no two ways about it because it's uh, pretty close combat in that bedroom. The coroner talked about the, you know, length of body parts being away from each other during the stabbing and how intimate an area it was on this bunk bed and so forth. There's no two ways about it. The, the, their corner, the, their evidence, you know, was that she was stabbed in the corner of her bunk, corner of her bedroom on the bunk bed. So that she's in the corner. So she has two walls to each side of her. Those walls are covered in blood. Well, blood doesn't just go certain ways. It also goes outward. The people admitted, their corner admitted the blood went outward. It doesn't just go to the sides, to the wall behind you. Okay, it also goes forward. In fact, almost all of it goes forward. So you're going to have a murderer who is absolutely covered. Okay. On, on top of that. Yeah. On top of that, Layla's body was not found on the bunk bed. It was found across the room in front of an open closet. So a distance of, let's say, six to eight feet at least. And again, the state's, the prosecution's uh, criminologist said it was his belief that she had to have been carried from the upper bunk to that location. Our guy, our expert, concurred. He, he believed the same thing. The DA ignored their own expert and said that she jumped from the bed to the floor. After she was stabbed. After, after being stabbed multiple times. And, and that's how she got there. Which And the reason for that is... There was, if you picked up the bleeding body of this eight-year-old girl and carried her, you would automatically be, be covered. Your whole front, if you, if the, if the spurting of blood didn't get you, that was going to get blood all over you. Yeah. And they didn't have an explanation for why they didn't find clothes like that that were associated with Isaiah. Her father picked her up off the floor. When he got there carried her down the hallway out to the front step where the, the arriving police officer got him to set her down so they could perform uh, CPR. And his T-shirt was completely covered in blood. And he sprayed it on Crystal, the mother, stepmother, and several places in the, in the, in the house. When he picked her up, scoops her, goes running down the hall, runs to the porch. He, he has sprayed it everywhere. It's it contaminated everywhere. The mother got it all over. Okay. Well, how is the murderer, if it's Isaiah, going to pick her up from the bunk bed and carry her through the room? When the cops get there, he's fine. Well, the answer is because he didn't do anything, right? And in fact, you know, and then we come to the issue of, which many of your viewers have probably seen in every crime show, Luminol. Yeah, yeah, the, great, blood glow. the great detector of blood. Um, the court seemed to accept the fact that luminol is a determinative test, and it is not. It only shows you that there is something there that might be blood. But the luminol was sprayed down the corridor and throughout the house looking for traces of blood, and the only blood it could find matched the footprints of the father carrying Layla out of the house. That was it. Nothing on the walls, nothing else. So whoever did this left no trace in that regard. They got into the house, they got out of the house. It, we believe. The DA would tell you that it's Isaiah, he never left the house. But they would not accept the fact that, well, if Isaiah didn't leave any footprints or handprints on the walls or anywhere else, that another person could have done that same thing. And it would seem more reasonable that a mature adult might do that than a 12-year-old would do that. 
Uh, and this house, by the way, this isn't a family that was ever going to appear in Sunset Magazine. Mm -hmm. yeah. This, you know, this, this house was not going to be a good housekeeping. Uh, I've seen uh, Isaiah, some... I, Isaiah was was not a little neat freak or anything like that. Um, on top of everything else, he wasn't an idiot, but he wasn't a neat freak. Um, and then we, I want to get back to the 911 call because this is one of the first uh, issues in the case and, and one that had us stymied until the opening arguments at the, at the trial. We received a copy of the audio recording of the 911 call and a transcript prepared by the DA's office or the sheriff's office or whomever that said clearly you could hear and that whoever transcribed it heard the same thing, said he was, Isaiah was asked by the 911 operator, what did he look like? What was he wearing? To which Isaiah in our version that we received said he was wearing black. In the opening argument, the DA's version was, and she played it for the court, he was black. And then she goes on to claim that in the course of the 911 call, he claims that he's a Hispanic, he's black, he's Hispanic. He, and he never makes any of those claims. But there's two different versions of the 911 call. And the, and the court decided to, and we have no explanation for that. Uh, but the court accepted the DA's version. Rather than have them, you know, like cancel each other out, the court accepted the DA's version. Uh, uh, I mean, so they that started to begin things. And I'm going to tell you honestly, when I first came on board the case, in fact, when I heard about it on the radio, I walked across the street because Mark and I happened to live across the street from each other. And I said, Mark, have you heard about this case in Valley Springs? The kid says somebody came in and stabbed his sister. I don't believe it. I think the kid did. And when I entered the case, that was my belief. And when I heard our version of the 911 call, I did a complete 180. Yeah. Without any other physical evidence, whatever we we're going to then disclose to you, I immediately, hearing Isaiah's voice and the fear and the trauma and everything else that was involved, I believed that we had an innocent kid. Yeah, you can't you can't act that way. You can't pull that off. You can't commit the murder of your sister and then call 911 and, and get into character and act like you're a scared witness, you know, of the death of your sister. You can't. It's well. And, um, So it was a rush to judgment. They arrested this kid. And then there was no evidence of who else the killer could have been. And that was the DA's entire theory was there's no proof that someone else did it. Well, that's not how we can pick people. And thank God we don't normally, we did it in this case, but thank God we don't normally do it. We don't normally say, well, we've charged this person and, and we've charged this person and no one else has walked in the courtroom and said they did it. So I guess since we got the person in the box here, we better, better close the top of the box and, Make sure we put this away in the closet somewhere so we're all safe. And um, you know that was the that was the problem. Um, and the family, by the way, his you know his father, and then his stepmother, and of course his natural mother. Um, everyone connected to him in the family knows that he's innocent. And this is their daughter. You know, this is their sister that uh, was killed brutally killed, and um, you know in a really horrendous fashion. And they all think he's one hundred percent. They don't even have a doubt. That he's innocent. They know he's innocent. Um, you know, the bottom line is that what it comes down to is, I think, is a 12 year old kid who doesn't understand the world like we do. And he, what happens is, you know, he goes in to use the restroom, and for whatever reason, somebody comes in and is, is you know, attacking this young girl. And he says something that you have to be in my profession, in John's profession, to know is a tell is a real significant matter. He says on the phone to the mother and to 911 that someone, I looked in Layla's room and this man was hitting her. This man was hitting her, okay? And then you know, he ran out. Well, let me tell you, every time you do a stabbing case, and I was a public defender for almost 15 years, every time you do a stabbing case, the eyewitnesses say that we saw this guy across the street and he was hitting this guy. And I saw him hitting him. So when a witness sees a hit, a, a stabbing, they never see a stabbing. They see a hit. They see a strike. They say, I thought he was hitting him. I thought he was hitting him in the gut. I thought he was hitting him in the shoulder. I thought he was hitting him in the chest. And then they find out, wow, their statement every time is, I thought they were being hit. 
And so when Isaiah tells somebody, you know, in live time, he was hitting Layla, okay? That's a 12-year-old boy. And that's because where he was back out in the bathroom, looking out into his sister's bedroom and sees the back of a guy hitting his sister, he doesn't know he's stabbing her. He does think he's hitting her. And so, you know, he's 12. He's in a bathroom. And from the day he was born, his dad said, because there were other kids that were stepchildren, he says, look, you're her real brother. You're four years older and you're the man family. You have to protect your sister. When you go to school, when we're not here, when you're playing in the neighborhood, you have to protect your sister. Your job is to protect your sister. You have to protect your sister. That's your sole function when your sister and you are around. So they leave him that day and say, we're going to leave you with your sister. And the goal, you know, the job is, you know, it's what your, it's what your job description is. You have to protect your sister. And, you know, most of us, when we're 12, our father often walks on water. Our father is everything to us. And their approval, you know, making them happy is what matters. So this is a little boy who is in the bathroom and someone comes in and stabs his sister and his father's on the way. And the guy's gone. The stabber is gone. He doesn't even know his sister's dead. And so he tells the police that, you know, I came out of the bathroom and the guy goes running out and I chased him. And so they said, look, there's no two ways that he chased this guy out of the house, the police say, and the DA. There's no two ways he chased this guy out of the house. So he's a liar. Well, because he's a liar, he's the murderer. And what we said was, he's not necessarily a liar. He's a guy who doesn't want to disappoint his dad or the world when they were watching when this happened. So he said, I came out of the bathroom and I chased, chased him out of the way. What's the harm in saying that? You make yourself feel better, Okay because you are now getting rid of something that's more uncomfortable than death itself, okay? And that is survivor's guilt. People commit suicide over survivor's guilt, okay? And so this is your, your sister and you're supposed to watch her. She's innocent, beautiful, and young and pure. She's now been killed, you know, and people are there and you say, hmm. I, I, I wasn't a coward. I didn't stay in the bathroom with the door locked and quiver like a coward. I opened the door and chased him out like a man. It didn't work out because she still died, but that's what I did. So instead of saying I stayed in the bathroom and I didn't get a good look at him, his story to the police was I opened the door and kind of, of the bathroom and came out and kind of chased the guy out of the house. And, you know, the DA was able to prove it's just they don't think that's true. And if it's not true, they say, then you've got a liar in the house with a young guy who's dead. Okay. And we say, you have a person who may, may, maybe didn't tell you the exact truth, but it doesn't mean they killed her. It means they have the worst survivor's guilt, you know, more, more insufferable than death itself, that you have to spend the rest of your life hearing those screams when you're a 12 year old boy supposed to protect your sister because your dad wants you to. Okay. And you're in that bathroom over there and you've got to spend the rest of your life hearing those screams. We know they were Isaiah, help me. Oh my God, Isaiah, Isaiah, or help, or help. Okay. She stepped 22 times. She bled to death. He's 12. So you either believe that this kid does it and has five minutes to do the, do the cleanup and then calls his parents as a safety valve to get him coming over there, or he didn't do it. And what I'm telling you is what happened. He's in the bathroom, some psychopath murders his sister, and he's left holding the knife, so to speak, even though he's not holding the knife, but he's left holding the bag. You know what I'm saying? But this 12 year olds are going to bend the truth a little bit about how brave they were. If you're a 12 year old boy and it's your eight year old sister. What do we want him to do? We want him to do that. So he told him a story that he opened the door and he chased the guy out if he saw him hitting. And they say, well, that's a lie. There's no way he chased him out. And if he's a liar and she's dead, he's the murderer. That's really faulty reason. If he's a liar, it's to save face. And it doesn't mean he's the murderer. It means he's trying to get rid of, as if it's some type of you know painkiller or opiate for his own psychic, you know, psyche, to not feel the pain of the fact that I stayed in the bathroom with a door locked. So that's why his story wasn't 100% accurate, probably, in my view. But it doesn't mean he's the murderer. It's the opposite. So it, it was not unreasonable for the county sheriff, Calvary's county sheriff and the DA, to consider Isaiah a suspect. Yeah. Because of the, of the positives they had, one of them is he is with absolute certainty the only person we know other than Layla who was in the house. We know with certainty there were two people in the house. 
that's Layla, the victim, and Isaiah, who is not a victim. Um, and I think at that point, the DA rolled the dice, thinking that all the forensic testing would come back and support them. And one by one, the forensic testing did not. Um, and so, it, in, in a way, it began with the night of the murder, a coroner was called in from Stockton uh, to perform the autopsy. And he was presented while performing the autopsy with two steak knives found on the ca- kitchen counter. As well as a bunch of other knives in the box. Right. A box full of knives. But go ahead. But they, so they show him these particular knives. Could these two, either of these two knives have been murder weapons? Very serrated knives. And to which he said, no, they don't look like a match. And he went about his business. He waves them off. He said, take them away. Those, those can't be the murder weapons. Right. Uh, his ego would come into play later. We'll, yes. we'll get to that. Yes. One of the exciting parts of the trial. But, um, and then a couple of weeks later, he received an email from the county sheriff saying, you know, we need you to reconsider that. I know you said they weren't the murder weapon, but essentially the, the email said, we really need this to be the murder weapon. Would you change your mind? And he did. Yeah, they, they said, look. So we had the email yeah. exchange as part of the evidence. There was an email that said, dear doctor, we know you said this can't be the murder weapon. We want you to know the boy uh, that her blood, excuse me, her blood was found under the handle. So in light of the fact that her blood was found under the handle, would you re, re, you know, recalculate your, your, your uh, opinion, your professional opinion? And he comes back and says, yeah, 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 I can't exclude it. It's possible that's the murder weapon. Now, that's the first of two times they would try to manipulate his opinion. The coroner, yes, exactly. And and we'll, we'll get to that. Now, what has never been reported in the press is that immediately following the murder, the county sheriff received two phone calls, one from a woman and one from her counselor in a battered woman's shelter in Calaveras County. And as it turned out, about a year before the murder, in a house directly across the street from 5621 Ripon Road, lived a woman whose name was Crystal with her daughter, Layla. Mm -hmm. The stepmother of the victim in our case is named Crystal. The victim is Layla. This other Crystal and Layla were hiding out from a gangbanger in Los Angeles who had threatened to kill them if they left town while he was in jail. In case this is giving you chills, I'm going to get another glass of water. (laughs) Just as an interesting aside. Now, the police, the uh, law enforcement in California County called down and they they found this guy was on probation, more or less, in a facility for anger management at the end of Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. And they essentially left it there. And they said that he had signed out that day, the day of the murder, which was a Saturday. And he signed out at about 10 or 11 o'clock. So physically, he could not have possibly gotten to Valley Springs personally. And Calaveras County Sheriff's Department was satisfied with that. When I called down there, I said, well, of course, you have some records and you have a, a video of the entry and exit. And the director said, uh, no, we're just putting that in. We don't actually have any direct evidence that he was the one who signed out. And I have to tell you, in all honesty, he could have left the building that night at any time. Also, he had access to his cell phone at all times. Now, Isaiah described the assailant that he allegedly chased out as a stocky guy, maybe around six feet tall, with long, shoulder-length gray hair. This particular individual was described as never having shoulder length hair. But I talked to the woman and she said the OGs, the old gangsters in his gang down in Long Beach, all had long hair. No one ever checked his cell phone to see if he was in communication with me, where it was pinging or anything else. That was just dropped by the police, but they didn't care. They, as far as they were concerned, they had their guy. Mm-hmm. So that's the first real twist in the case. Then the evidence started to not come in, is really the best way to say it. 
So the Department of Justice took the traps from all the sinks in the house, Mark's already talked about this, and tested them for evidence of blood or cleanup, and it came back empty, nothing, negative. And they searched the kids' bathroom, and there was no sign of blood in there. So, there, there, was some, there was some luminol hits, but luminol is affected or reacts with a particular protein. And the laundry list of items, including urine, so there's the bathroom, by the way, urine and a whole bunch of other things is goes on for pages. Yeah. So all it means is it's a presumptive test that you should do further testing to see if it's blood. All the tests they took from the bathroom were negative. Absolutely negative. Nothing in the drains, no, no bloody clothes found, no luminol footprints for Isaiah, no luminol handprints on the walls, none of that. The only footprints match Barney. So then we proceed, and in the, they take DNA samples from everybody that could have been in the house, family members, people that they knew, law enforcement. And by the way, I'm surprised that law enforcement, they always have to take law enforcement's DNA to rule them out. Why it isn't on file like a CODIS file, I don't understand. So it didn't even have to be done. It should speed things up, but that's an aside. So they took all the samples, and um, in the process of examining Layla's body, they found a single one of her hairs from her head between her buttocks, underneath her underwear. And on that DNA, was, un was unidentified male DNA. And the source of the DNA is either blood or semen. Because the strength of it is such that it can only be from three sources, saliva, blood, or semen. And saliva has a particular enzyme present that was not present in this sample. So it eliminated saliva. So Layla had unidentified male DNA under her underwear. There was no evidence of a sexual assault, by the way. We'll just get that out of everybody's mind right now. This, but, was, this was like blood on her hair, though. This was a piece of her hair? I just wanted to... a piece of her hair with unidentified male blood, and it was found between her buttocks under her underwear. And the prosecution said that's a random thing. Uh, so we proceed to trial. There's no physical evidence. Isaiah's DNA isn't on the railing to the bunk bed. Um, it, it doesn't really show up in the room. Uh, there's nothing that ties him to this murder, uh, except there was a T-shirt found in a laundry basket with one tiny spot of blood on it. They tested it. It had a, a combination of DNA for Layla and Isaiah, one tiny little spot. And on the back, there was an imprint of some kind of object in blood. And they could never determine what it was. But it wasn't the spray covered in blood. And they claimed that this was the shirt that Isaiah must have been wearing when he stabbed her. Yeah. We think, in fact, that it was blood left by one of the police officers. Yeah who got blood on him from Layla yeah. when performing CPR. And what's also interesting is that the police officer who found it in the laundry basket somehow noticed a tiny bit of blood, but never reported the blood print on the back of the shirt yeah. in her report. Um, and it obviously is for some kind of object, but no one can tell what it is. So we move forward and no forensic evidence, a, a, a void, an absence of forensic evidence uh, exists. And we feel we have a very good chance at trial. But the next twist in the case comes up. And before I get to that, let me talk a little bit about the history of the house they were in. It was a rental property. Okay. The previous renter was growing pot. He had a pot grow in the room where Layla was killed. When the family moved in, they had to take the tape down from the windows. They you know, had covered the windows to block them. And the house smelled of pot. He admitted to, to that. 
also there was a, it was a raccoon's tail, right? A raccoon's yeah. tail hanging from a limb and a tree in the backyard. And initially everyone thought, oh, this is Jeffrey Dahmer evidence. Yeah. Well, it turned out that guy who was growing the pot also had coon dogs, raccoon hunting dogs. And he had found some roadkill and hung it in the tree to use to train the, his dogs. Get them excited over the scent, I guess. So, um, so that we could, we could throw that out. So do you have any questions about it? I mean, why you think he was, what, what evidence the people had or why he was convicted or do you have any questions? I'm curious about the, uh, the eyewitness, the neighbor, it was there a neighbor that that saw someone leaving? Saw the Anthony bus? Gonzalez. Yeah, Anthony Gonzalez. So it, it so so here's what happens: is at twelve o'clock, roughly, right about twelve o'clock, the the stepmother gets the phone call at the ball field. Says, "Oh my God, this guy's hitting Layla." Then nine one one calls in at around twelve o five or something like that, right? So twelve in the afternoon on this Saturday afternoon is when the, the the police cars go screaming out there, the ambulance goes screaming out there. And they run out, and as he is in the front yard, the cop says, okay, be really clear with me, young man. What does this guy look like? What is he? He gives a description about this grayish kind of hair, a certain height and weight, Hispanic uh, Hispanic accent, you know, but he sees him from behind. But he gives a description of a guy. But it's a really kind of, um, to me, it's a picturesque, it's very vivid description of height and weight, kind of stocky, 5'10-ish or whatever, you know, uh, muscular, long, curly kind of gray hair, um, certain age, from behind. And that exact description is a little unique. And they say, okay, and oh, I'm sorry, and, and clothing about this Pendleton and, and jeans, jeans and this kind of a Pendleton and tennis shoes. And, you know, kind of sounds, sounds like prison guard, but anyway. So he gives them, they write it down, thank you very much. They don't put a bolo out yet. Okay, but they go canvassing and they go knocking at the house directly. But in the country there, this is over an acre away. Okay, this is a football field of walking through through the barley fields, right? And you get to the next house and knock. Hey, sir, he says, yeah, you know, the 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 person says, yeah, I see the helicopters everywhere. I see, you know, everything's blocked off. What's going on? They say, well, we need to ask you if you see anything strange. And he says, yeah. There's this guy about 5'10", kind of stocky in his 50s, with like curly, shoulder-length gray hair, a Pendleton and, and jeans or whatever. And he comes running by and he's hiding beneath my windowsill. And he's looking and he's hiding behind, he's hiding underneath. He's crouching down underneath my windowsill. So like I won't see him as he's passing by my property and goes running by about 15 minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. Wow. So that, I mean, I mean, if anybody wants to come up with any, you know, logical um, explanation that defeats that, any, any, anything based in reason or science about the odds of a witness saying he looked like this and this is what he was doing in this time frame. And that is the exact, you know, you would think, I wonder if Isaiah and this guy had called each other and coordinated this. Because if they didn't coordinate it, then it happened. Yeah. Yeah, and that's okay. obviously, I mean, the descriptions are identical. Yeah, so, and we put that before the trial judge. That, that report, that statement from that witness, and the judge said, yeah, okay, guilty. I'm also curious about the 911 call, uh, that there being two different versions. Yeah, really, yeah. really weird, because the people's whole thing was, Isaiah, look, the people's whole story was that this kid did not tell a perfect story, okay? He had inconsistencies. Have you ever talked to a 12-year-old about what happened? Or even an adult, or something that happens in a time of crisis, I've been witness to, to in these things where I'm like, did you just see that? And somebody else completely froze up, didn't see anything happen at all. It's, yeah. Well, what you're telling us is very consistent with 200 years of scientific literature and study about it that exact issue about eyewitness identification. So, but but other than that, so, um, but other than that, there's nothing compelling about what you said. So my point is, um, I'm sorry for being sarcastic, but yeah. So they say, look, Isaiah's a liar. He, he first says it was a black man. And then half the way through his 9-1 call, it says it's a Mexican. Which he never said. Okay, so that's a lie. They say he's a liar. <laughs> and then they say, 
And he tells us another thing that he chases the guy to the house and that didn't happen. Okay. Now the problem is he never said that. He said, he said, what color, what was it? What shirt was it? What was he wearing? Was he wearing? And as, as they're talking, he's answering and he's at, and, you know, he's animated. He's 12, but he goes, he was wearing a lot. And they say, oh, say he was a black man. And so they hung their hat on his story had inconsistencies. Therefore he's the murderer. We hung our entire story on the science makes him innocent. Okay. The science makes him innocent. His story is their case. And it's the story of a 12 year old. Okay. I mean, what would you go to bed peacefully, you know, with complete harmony in your soul and conscience about what happened? If it's, we say this, the 12 year old had inconsistencies. And then the, the defense lawyer said, yeah, but the science is ironclad that he didn't do it. And, and there is there is more science. Yeah. Two, two more critical areas, one of which only came out at trial. And, and there are, and it was one of two moments at trial in which, as I sat there at the bench with Mark and his partner, uh, Steve Flesser, I thought- hey, let, One of the lesser criminal defense attorneys in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with my law partner, Steve, we're still best friends. We're just not law partners. So, so, and I thought at those moments, we just won the case. Yeah. There's no way this judge can agree. One of them um, was the issue of the timing of the case. So what happened was the first two people other than the father to reach Layla, the first was a Calaveras County uh, sheriff, deputy sheriff, who began CPR on the front steps of the house. He was then replaced by an EMT from the local ambulance outfit, um, who then took over. In their statements at the time, they made no mention of whether Layla was warm or cold to the touch, uh, which goes to time of death. Which was important. Whether, which, whether, which was clearly a big deal, but they made, they made no reference. So let me just really yeah. quickly just put a pause on that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the point was, we said, look, everybody, this kid watches the movie with her and then she's dead and he calls the police. Come on, you know, you don't have time. They said, no, that's a big lie. Okay, the last time he talked to his mother was 1045, remember? So this guy, the cops get there at 12. This guy had an hour and a half. He does her back at 1045 and then he's got an hour and a half to, you know, clean things up. So that was their whole theory. That was their whole theory is that Mr. Reichel says he couldn't have done it because he had five minutes. And they said, no, 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 that's a lie. They never put the movie on. This guy did her back then at 10, you know, 1030 or whatever it was. And so they say, so of course you have an hour and a half to clean up, despite the fact there was no towels, no paper towels, no, no proof of a cleanup. So our whole thing was to prove, hey, look, the time of death was shortly before the cop got there. And their whole thing was the time of death was an hour and a half earlier. And that set the stage for time of death. Really significant, super important matter was time of death as the trial was going on. Now, John. Did so you. they get the deputy sheriff on the stand and they ask him, how did she feel to you? And he says, she was cold to the touch. And then they get the EMT on the stand. Very experienced guy. Big burly guy, a guy that if you were pinned under a car and an EMT showed up, he's the one you'd want to be able to lift the car, you know, and get you out. Um, and he says she was cold to the touch. Unfortunately, he said something else in his report. Right. In his report, which requires a double password to fill out on his computer, and it was filled out immediately following this whole episode. Of course. So, yeah, so she, there's a hospital. He turned her over to the, the hospital. She's dying, bleed out. They have to do their report, and, the, and they do it. But go ahead. So he fills out the report in the company of his intern. And in the report, there's an area, and it says, I, you know, what is touch? He says, uh, warm to the touch in the report. Then he goes down below, and there's this thing called a capillary refill rate something that is a very simple test. You just pinch somebody's fingernail and the amount of time it takes for the pink to return is the capillary refill rate. For the blood to come back, obviously. Yeah, yeah. He indicates in his report, the less than two seconds. 
which is the equivalent of a living human being. The heart is still pumping blood. So in two areas of the report, he claims that she's warm to the touch and the cap rate, and the cap rate is less than two seconds. So we hold on to this. And I say we, I have to give, I, I got to give a lot of credit to Steve Plesser on this because he exercised great patience. One of the lesser criminal defense in Sacramento. <laughs> and and uh, this is Shane Stevenson here to blow his own horn. <laughs> um, but Steve went through the cross-examination of, e, uh, of the EMT and let it slide. Then we brought the coroner on the, we didn't bring on, the, the, the people brought the coroner on and we did the cross-examination, Steve did the cross-examination of the coroner. And this is where the coroner's ego came into play. Mm -hmm. So what they had done was they told the coroner I got it. that he was going, that the deputy sheriff and the EMT were going to say she was cold to the touch. And based on that, he was going to say that she died an hour and a half or more earlier. So Steve then did the cross of the coroner and he said, is there any way that she could have died soon? He said, no, there's nothing that could change my mind. No. Nothing. Four times by my count, my memory, Steve got him to say, nothing could change my mind. And finally he got the report from the EMT in front of the coroner. Had him read it, showed it to him. And he said, would you read that line there, number two on page one? What does that say? Uh, warm to the touch. At which point, the color started to drain from his face. Hmm. He said, we should turn to page two. What does it say for capillary refill rate? He said, less than two seconds. Isn't that the equivalent of a living human being? And he turned to the DA with disgust in his face yes. and said, yes, it is. And then he said to the judge, I've never seen this report, Your Honor. I've never seen this. He wanted to make sure that it was understood that, you know, he'd never seen this report. Yeah. So that was point number two, where I thought, we just won the case. So you understand what I'm saying is this is the main expert for the, their, their theory was this, this child was stabbed an hour and a half earlier. Our theory was this child was just stabbed. Okay. So that was the whole big end of the cow, as we used to say in Baz Rebels, okay, where the meat is, right? And their coroner comes in. He's the one that's going to, you know, he's batting cleanup on this. And he says, no, it happened, you know, an hour and 45 minutes earlier. Yep. And we said, can we just show you something, sir? Take a look at this. When she died, and he said, boy, just a few minutes before the cops got there. So if that was their whole case, and that was our whole case, you know. So then there was one more other interesting moment that, in all honesty, fell into our lap. It shouldn't have, but it did. The DOJ expert, the Department of Justice expert for fingerprints, was on the stand. Yeah. And the DA took him through all the fingerprints found in the house and he identified them as family members and whatever, all of which made sense being where they were. And suddenly he said, and then on the doorway, two thirds of the way, on the doorway leading into her room, on the door, let me not say the doorway, the door, two thirds of the way up the door leading into her room was an unidentified fingerprint. Yeah. And on the door frame, of that door was another unidentified fingerprint. And the DA, it was her direct, and she was stuck with having to ask, where did this come from? Where is it in your report? And he said, and he looked through his report because they have all their notes to refresh their memory because they handle all these cases. He said, oh, it's not, oh, it's in my notes. It wasn't in my report. And no one wanted to ask the question, uh, would this be consistent with a child or an adult? Yeah. Because it could make a, you know, a further hurt one side or the other. But that's where it stood. So we had unidentified DNA found on her person, male DNA, from either blood or semen. We had unidentified fingerprints going into the door going on the doorway, going into the room where she was attacked. And we had established that the time of death was very close to noon. And at that point, I thought, we're going to win this case. And despite those three things alone, 
uh, and the history of the house. You know, I, I talked about the guy who broke through pot, but the person who rented the house before him yeah. was selling drugs to everybody in Calaveras County. And we found out later was selling guns too. Um, but the cops never found the guns. They found the drugs, but they never found the guns. Um, so you had a history at this house of meth heads and, you know, all kinds of druggies going in and out all the time. And it was never considered a possibility that someone came back to the house looking for money and or drugs. The house looked empty. They went in and sadly found Layla and freaked out and stabbed her. Which is a, a reasonable, it seemed to me, explanation. Uh, plus we had, this was in a time when post-2008, a lot of houses in that area were going through foreclosure. Yeah. And literally down the street, and by that I mean downhill down the street, two, two doors down was an abandoned house for that reason. And about 10 days beforehand, two young women, when I say young women, they were young teenagers, yep. um, decided they wanted to go into the house to explore it. They actually asked Isaiah if he wanted to go in with them. And between you and me, Isaiah was an idiot for saying no, because these were two of the cutest girls you could ever imagine. Um, but he stayed at the house. They went back down, went into the house. When they went into what was supposed to be an abandoned house, they described newspapers, open cracker, you know, boxes on the kitchen counter, uh, toilet paper in the in the bathroom with a clogged sink. And when they went into what would be the master bedroom, there was one of those huge box TVs that were like three feet deep before we got flat screens. Yeah, and stuff. yeah, the old ones. Right. And it was actually plugged in. And it was just, you know, the war of the ants, the black and white interference yeah, yeah, know, yeah. stuff on the screen. Yeah. But from an open attic way, they heard a male voice, get out of here. And they took off and one of them told her mother about it. She called the police afterwards. Um, the interesting thing was, you know, so was it someone there that went up to the house? But when Mark and I, the first day we went to Valley Springs to check out the area, check the house, check the room where the murder happened, talk to the people, canvas the neighborhood. We were looking at that house and it was still unlocked. Yeah. The police had gone through it and was still unlocked. And as we came around the side, a neighbor who shall remain nameless confronted us. Fairly big guy. So what are you guys doing here? And I stepped up to him and I said, uh, and I explained. I said, I'm an investigator. This is the attorney in the case. I introduced us. Um, I said, you know, we're here. And I told him the story about the two girls. Yeah. And he looked at me and, pardon my language, he said, that's bullshit, yelling in my face. Bullshit, total bullshit. I take care of this house. I'm the caretaker. I run it for the bank and I do so the other houses. And that's bullshit. I said, I thought it was a like, whoa, dude, seriously. I haven't accused you of anything. Seriously, where's all the anger coming from? Exactly. You know, what is this all about? So we got in Mark's face also. And Mark picked up booze on his breath. I, I didn't, I have to be honest with you, but I was I was so taken aback that uh, I'm surprised I'm not surprised that I missed that. Uh, so we fast forward to trial and his wife was someone that the DA was going to bring in to say, well, I was out in front of the house that morning. I didn't hear or see anything. And we were able to establish that in fact, she was running a lawnmower at the time, so she wouldn't have heard anything. And and as it turned out, she was too far away. Their own test proved that she was too far away. And B, being in the front yard, she couldn't actually see the house. Being in her front yard, she could not see the Fowler's house. So we established that. But while she was on the stand, this guy, her partner, was in the courtroom with another guy, a younger guy. And the whole time he sat on the aisle of the benches for the audience, just leaning forward on, uh, on edge. And when she was done with her testimony and Mark took it easy on her, 
She walked out. He followed her out. The DA called for a recess. She and her associate and paralegal all ran out, and we saw them arguing with these people afterwards. We have no idea what that's about. My belief is that guy knew somebody who had been in the house, that he was involved with that person being in the house. And in fact, his abs his present, he was absent at the time, and that absence has never been uh, explained. Hmm. We know from other witness testimony that people drove up that were identified by neighbors as having a van being in the neighborhood, stopping at that house. They ran the plates. They found the guy. I, he said, I stopped at the house to talk to, to this guy. And he wasn't there. The woman who was the witness told me he wasn't there. Uh, and then I eventually left. She said in her interview with the police that he wasn't there, but they never interviewed him and found out where he was. Now, I don't know if the guy was involved or not, but it certainly is suspicious. And his reaction was such. And, his, and, and why the hell the DA had to take a recess to go out in the, into the corridor and engage in an animated argument with these people, we have no idea because we never heard what the substance of the, of the argument was. Uh, but the, the, the three points, the unidentified DNA, the unidentified fingerprints, and establishing the time of death at close to noon, I honestly thought, in the absence of any cleanup, of any clear cleanup, plus what's common in a stabbing case is if a knife does not have a hilt, it's very common that the hand will get wet from the blood and slip onto the blade and it damages the hand. And they cut themselves with it. There were no, there was no damage on Isaiah's hand or hands, none. And experts have told us also that, because I, I, I I looked for experts in the area of, you know, the use of knife, knives and stabbing for that very purpose. And I got a guy out in Virginia who used to work with the FBI. And he said, and I told him the story. He said, wait, stop. As soon as I told, got to the part where they alleged that Isaiah stabbed her 22 to 40 times, he said, stop. Your kid didn't do it. He said, all the examination, he said, first of all, juvenile stabbings are incredibly rare. And there are never more than one or two stab wounds. He said, this is a crime from the adult anger. Now we couldn't we never got that into evidence. Um, but it, it tells you from an expert point of view, I mean, these there was no evidence that this brother and sister had any animosity toward each other. Everyone talked about how well they got along together, how protective he was. So it, it wasn't like they were each other's throats all the time. He had made he made her pancakes that morning and shot a picture of the pancakes to his parents. So he goes from making pancakes for his sister. And putting a movie on for her, you know, and movie on for her to stabbing her more than 20 times. None and that cleans it up so well that the FBI and Calaveras County Sheriff's Department and the California Department of Justice can't find any sign, any uh, sign of it. The uh, the fingerprints that were on the uh, was it on the hallway outside of her door. Actually, on the door leading into her room and on door the door the door frame leading into her room. Where were they able to? Were they like legible prints? Were they able to actually? Yeah. And they found no matches for the DNA found on her or the prints. Uh, that, that's, uh, did they actually run those through, you know, like criminal databases nationwide? Yeah. Or? Yes, they did. The, uh, the unidentified DNA was submitted to CODIS. Um, the, uh, and at the time, there was, it was considered possible that that DNA belonged to a male relative of her birth father, Barney Fowler. And as a result, the DA sent out investigators to get DNA samples from every known male DNA, uh, excuse me, male relative of Barney's going as far away to Reno, and none of them matched. What we found about a, after the first trial was that Barney's 
birth father was not the guy he grew up with. So the deck search was meaningless. Yeah, it didn't. Wow. But the problem is, you know, and what we would like to do, and what we are trying to do, have been trying to do essentially for a year, is, you know, the whole Golden Gate killer case, rapist yeah. case, has opened up um, Public gene pop genealogical yeah. DNA searches. Yeah. Which is what we would like to do. The problem is DOJ uses a, a testing method, a YSTR, that is not compatible with all these other commercial databases like Ancestry and GEDmatch and you know 23andMe and everybody else. So you have to retest the sample. Um, and what they do is, I, and I apologize if I'm telling you and your viewers stuff they already know, but when they test DNA, they take the sample, they put it in a solution and create what's called an extract. So that you have a larger volume that you're testing. Okay. And we want to, we want to know that the extract exists and it can be retested by these other means so that we can do a genealogy test. So over the course of the summer, um, we've gone through a number of things. You know, we went through the second trial, we got the, the negative verdict, and there was a second appeal. A new attorney by the name of Byron Lichstein, a uh, very bright guy with a long history with the Innocence Project, um, wrote the appeal. We've also been trying, we, we filed a motion to retest DNA. One of the other areas that we wanted to retest test, which I have to be honest with you, I never thought of uh, during the original trial or the second trial, was we wanted to also test the tape used to lift the fingerprints from the door and the door jam, because DNA is left on those as well. And I never thought of that. No one thought of that at the time. Even though it was in the literature, we were not well enough versed in DNA, and almost nobody was in 2013. Um, and if we could get even a partial match between the DNA on the tape from the fingerprints on the door to the DNA found on Layla, that would eliminate the randomness argument made by the DA. Yeah. Um, so these are things we want to retest. Those motions have been denied, and it should be noted that they were denied by the same judge who rendered the second opinion, which means she would be putting her own opinion in jeopardy by allowing us to retest DNA. Is that, is that, a, is that a conflict of interest then, her having the, the initially, power? Initially, the motion was not to be heard by her. And you're right, I think, I think it is. Um, the motion was originally not to be heard from her. The DA got it uh, postponed until she got back from vacation and it was trans that hearing was transferred to her. But they also waited until after the first, the second appeal was denied by the appellate court here in, in uh, Sacramento. Um, and, and then she denied the motion on the hearing for the DNA. It was incredibly, is incredible. We're still fighting it legally, but, uh, the interesting thing is at the same time, back in about February, I received a letter completely out of the blue from an inmate in federal custody <clears throat> who said, I got to tell you, my understanding is that it was drug guys in Stockton mm -hmm. who put the hit on Layla because Barney had alleged, Barney, her father had allegedly ripped them off for drug money. And Barney told the Calaveras County DA that right away, I got to tell you, I used to deal drugs in Stockton. I dealt with the Mexican cartels. I'm out of the business. I moved here to get away from the business. I don't think this is involved, but you should know about that. They also received a call what, from the Stockton PD who received a call from an anonymous source saying that she, you know, it was a female, uh, made the same claim. 
At the same time, I got the information from this one federal prisoner. I got information from the woman who used to sell drugs out of the house because I'd established the relationship with her talking to her over the period of the trial. And she said she had heard the same thing. And they, and they provided names and what have you. What's interesting is the federal agent who interviewed this federal prisoner uh, up in Nevada County, because he's being held up in Nevada County Jail. Um, the report was filled out, let's say the beginning of March of this year, was sent to the Calaveras County DA, and it was never sent to us until after the hearing in which the judge denied our motion for the DNA in September, for the DNA testing. It appears it was held, and, and in fact, the, the assistant DA um, signed off on it the day of the hearing, but it was not mailed for another month. So it appears that they were holding, withholding potentially exculpatory evidence until after the second um, decision by the appellate court and their, the deferred DNA hearing. So combined with everything, it appears, look, look at the issue is they don't want to take, do anything that could take a, an X out of the wind column. That's what it appears to me. Yeah, that's, that's complete corruption right there. I mean, the, the not disclosing evidence to the defense is, is, I mean, every, I mean, I don't know how many movies I've seen where, where they've played that one through. Yes. I, I can't believe it. <sighs> that's because you, you're fortunate enough to only get to see it in the movies. How would you like to do it seven days a week for 365, 52 weeks a year? Really? It's that common? Yeah, unfortunately, it's listen. all about winning, man. And we here's another one is that wow, this guy, this this ambulance, this uh, EMT that he talked about. Oh yeah, he mentions this, you know, in, intern and everything. So we find after the trial's over, we get a hold of the intern. We find him. He's long moved on, long moved on. We get a hold of him. He well, says, tell him the EMTs follow up the testimony because that's least of the intern. They brought when, when we showed that the intern, the EMT, <laughs> had written a report that we use to get the coroner you know to that. change his yeah. testimony. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. yeah, but they brought the EMT back in the next day. And he said, oh, I didn't really fill out that report. I didn't read it closely enough. My intern filled it out. I'm seeing your eyes bug out. So trial ends, we get convicted. We're not happy. We call, we, we, a year later, we're driving around somewhere else. We get a hold of the intern. He finally calls us back. He goes, what's this about? I, I moved on. I was there that one day. I don't do that anymore. What's this about? I said, remember this trial? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, we'd like to ask you about, you know, about well, whether you filled out this form. And he goes, huh, that's interesting. Why didn't I come testify at the trial? I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, remember when you guys subpoenaed me to come testify? I said, we never subpoenaed you, my friend. He said, I got, I said, I'm not the DA, buddy. I'm, I'm the defense attorney. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. I got your subpoena for the trial from the DA. And I said, right, exactly. I said, you did. And why didn't you show up? He said, well, they called me at the last minute and said, no, 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 no. It's our subpoena. Uh, you don't need to come testify. We don't want you here. So uh, I, had taken, I had taken the day off and everything. So I just thought, well, they told me not to come, so I didn't go. And I said, right, I understand. You know, I said, just so you know, they called you because Morehouse, the EMT had just testified. And you became really crucial. So they called off your subpoena. He goes, oh, that's why. Because I was all ready to come down and testify. I had to drive down from Reno or whatever. And he said, but uh, last minute I got that call. Oh, I thought it was you guys. Oh, so it was the DA who called me off. I said, yeah, it was the DA who called you off. Because if you would have testified under oath, you would have given facts with no bias. No horse in the race. You would have given facts which would have assisted the search for the truth which would have resulted in the truth being heard. That's why we were called off, my friend. Now, say, uh, here, here's the issue is, uh, you know, post 9-11, first responders, you know, they could do no wrong. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm just speaking only for myself here. 
it never occurred to me that an EMT would lie. Because what horse do they have in the race, really? Exactly. And so it never occurred to us, you know, that Morehouse was going to was going to come back in and say, oh, my intern filled it out and I didn't read it. Now, in listening to Morehouse's, uh, the audio of his interview that afternoon with the police, you hear him turning pages. He's going through his report with the cops. Mm -hmm. okay. And it is the intern, intern who said, listen, it's a double password system. I didn't know the pass. I couldn't open it. I couldn't do it by myself. I was with him, but he filled it out. On top of that, it's probably the most important report he'd ever filled out in his life. How often are you involved in something like this? Well, to your point, there had not been a homicide in Calaveras County in over two years before this. This the whole thing stinks. It's starting to remind me of uh, a thin blue line uh, oh. that Errol Morris documented. Errol Morris, one of my favorites in 1987, 88, yeah. Yeah, great, great I, film. I know all about it, yeah. And, and what it comes down to is, that, in my opinion, is, you know, DAs don't want to lose. They, they rolled the dice that Isaiah did it. And initially, that was not an unreasonable thing to do. Good point. I can't deny them that. But as the evidence continued to not appear to support them, they felt, and, and part of this is public pressure. Uh -huh. DAs and police departments, law enforcement generally, we as a public mm -hmm. want an instant resolution so we can feel safe. Yeah. And so part of that is that pressure on them. And once they commit to a line of reasoning, it's very, very difficult for them to do a 180 or even a 90 degree turn and say, hey, listen, it looks like we got it wrong because now it means, and it's in my opinion, it still means that killer is out there. I I can I can see yeah I, I completely understand what you're saying and it and it makes sense from that perspective but then it's the lie starts to take a life of its own and then they're actively doing things to protect those lies like telling witnesses not to show up um, or not disclosing evidence and I mean at that point what separates you from a criminal? Um, well, that, and you know there we would subpoena witnesses in the case yeah and then. And we have to notify the other side. No, that's all part of the give and take. And we would notify them that we were going to subpoena witnesses A, B, and C. And then they would show up and they would serve a subpoena also. And that's typical in civil or criminal cases. It's like everybody, it's cover your ass kind of a thing. Make sure the person absolutely shows up. And they would send sheriffs out in their squad cars yep. in uniform and hand a subpoena to our witness and say, how did you, uh, how were you served in this case? And most people think you got to serve a subpoena, you got to put it right in somebody's hand. And if, that's not true. If, if I call you and I say, I want to subpoena you, would you accept service? You got a fax machine or if you got, email. you know, can I attach it to an email or whatever? And you say, yeah, I'll take it that way. If you consent, then we can serve it to you that way and it saves everybody time and money. And if, for example, you don't have somebody driving up to your house serving papers on you for the neighbors to, to gossip about, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So they they would say, oh, no, I got it by fax or I got it by email. And the cops would go, well, I don't I don't think that's valid. I'm not sure you have. Yeah, you don't have to up. appear for the defendants because they didn't serve you properly. So we're going to give you legal advice. We're, we're actually the, we're the adversary. We know they want you for what you're going to testify to. So we're just here to tell you that, you know, um, can you see my badge? You see my car right there? Okay, you see my the, the gun on my hip? You see this beautiful, regal, and handsome uniform? Okay. I'm telling you, you don't have to appear for that. And in, in the search for the truth, how, how does that sit with you? And just so you know, my friend Phil, this goes on seven days a week, 30 days, 30 days a month, 12 months a year, in, in 50 states, in America. It's the exact opposite of uh, 
of the, don't they take an oath? So is, 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 is there a law enforcement right. oath, or am I thinking? What's the violent, well, can I ask you this? What's the what's the consequence? What's the punishment? What's the punitive consequence for for not abiding by your oath? There isn't one, but I was in the Marine well, Corps. You said and there is one. That just and makes you just told me there isn't one. Are you? Is it fair to say? You're right. There, there's there's none. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and listen, to you and to all of your viewers, I recommend a series on Netflix <laughs> called The uh, Innocence. I, I've watched, I've been watching those. Those are excellent. And when the whole COVID came in, I went into that, and I was yelling at the screen at times. <laughs> uh, but this highlights almost everything we're talking about in this case, sometimes more egregiously. But... Um, you know, it talks about eyewitness, the weakness in eyewitness, uh, you know, identifications, yeah. Yeah. which is, you know, they, that's one of the first things you learn in law school. Um, and, and it talks about withholding of evidence or manipulating evidence or how, you know, your confessions are manipulated. And, and it's really outstanding. So and I, I can't I, recommend it enough. I would be remiss to not mention that. I'm one of the few people that has an investigator that has a law degree. <laughs> he has a law degree from a good school. He just he's an investigator who who fairly lets me try most of my cases. <laughs> <laughs> he's a great asset. Well, right. I'll tell you, in in this case, there were moments that I wish were if they ever make a movie of this case, yeah. or anything. So they better include it in the movie. Can I close with, uh, they were great. We both are good friends with a guy we have a lot of admiration for who's in the criminal justice world, who was the head of the FBI, um, a certain segment of the FBI, a certain head, a segment of the military intelligence unit, and a certain uh, segment of the uh, defense DNI. Anyway, so his name is Ron Hilly. And Ron is, was, was president of the National Polygraphers Association, and he was an FBI agent. As I said, he calibrates the FBI polygraphers and the CIA polygraphers and the um, National Intelligence polygraphers. So if you're a polygrapher who does polygraph exams every three years, of course, you have to get recertified. So you go to Ron, who gives you the test. Ron Hilly, great guy. So no one passes a Ron Hilly polygraph. I've known Ron for almost 20 years. No one passes a Ron Hilly polygraph. So we had Isaiah polygraphed. And Ron called me and said, let me just tell you one thing, Mark, okay? I'm gonna videotape him, I'm gonna hook him up with the most modern, you know, the most uh, state-of-the-art stuff. And here's the problem, you got a 15, Mark, you got a 15-year-old kid, okay? They're gonna be all over the charts, right? They're gonna be very difficult to do. Secondly, he, he's the witness to the death of his sister. So is, this isn't gonna work, buddy. You're wasting your money, Mark. And as John will tell you, we did this for free for five years. But anyway, I still said, doing it. yeah, still doing it for free. And I said, that's okay, Ron, I'm going to waste my money. It's, I'm not, you know, at least I'm not buying too expensive of scotch. And Ron said, okay, you're going to spend a lot of money. And I'm going to tell you that I can't get a reading. And I said, I still want you to do it. I said, all right, man. So he goes out to El Dorado County Jail and he, he gets this kid. It's six hours. And he comes back and he says, there's never been a 15-year-old that can pass a polygraph. And he said, he didn't just pass it. His charts are so high for truthfulness that I'm going to send him around the nation and find anybody, put it up to anybody. And he's, he was at one point president of the uh, Polygraphers Association of FBI agents, CIA agents, and so forth. Um, and he said, anybody that can knock it down and say it's, it's not valid because they get the charts, they get the video, they get the live time, everything. And they all came back and said, wow, Ron, that, you scored it too low. He was way more, he was way more honest than you even scored it. So he called me and he said, you know, there's this, this the, the guy didn't do it, Mark, just so you know. Just so you know, between you and I, Mark, so you can sleep, we're not sleeping at night, the guy didn't do it. He said, great, thank you, Ron. So um, that is, we, we went to court, we tried to get the polygraph motion exclude, included. I said, look, I want you to understand that he passed this polygraph. Here it is. And the judge said, polygraphs aren't admissible. I'm so, really just, sorry about that grub. No, well, you don't have to apologize. So, so we'll just tell you, look, he got a polygrapher who I've known forever. And Ron's, and I mean, I, I would, I would honestly put my life on the line on a Ron Hilly polygraph, polygraphy. And so he says, Mark, the guy didn't, this kid didn't do it. 
you know, and so but that's not admissible, but it is admissible to me. It's admissible to anybody else who knows what they're doing. Remember, if you're going to lose your job in the CIA, they put you on a poly. If you're in Congress and they think you leak something in the press, they put you on a poly. If you, oh, you want to get a job and with a secret, top secret clearance, you got a poly you. Okay. If you're the sheriff's department and they think you leak something to the media, they need to poly you. But this kid, walk, he blows a poly up with he's never been so honest. And that's not something we want to talk about. Come on, man. What more do we need to do? You know what I mean? But it's a judge trial. And the judge said, hey, man, um, I want to find this guy guilty. So when you're done, Mr. Reichel, please allow me to bang my effing gang. You know what I mean? And that's justice in America. As, as Mark and Steve said at the time, had this been to a jury. Yeah. And there were some other issues. But had this been to a jury in the age of CSI. Yeah. They would have wanted... They would have been, they would not have bought this verdict in the absence of the forensic supporting forensic evidence. There were some other issues. For example, the DA in her closing misrepresented the height of the bunk. Isaiah has a certain height and weight, and it's the length of his arm is a certain amount. So we set it up during the trial with their criminals, their criminals, Department of Justice. He's done a million cases where we said, okay, blah, blah, blah. So she, where did she, where was she stabbed? She was stabbed in the corner in the bunk bed. She's in, in, in a bunk bed up there like this, and she's being stabbed. Well, there's a height of the bunk bed. There's a height of Isaiah. There's an arm length of Isaiah. Fair to say that, you know, he, he can only reach so far, whatever. Our point was it's an adult male who has a much longer reach. And so, so, she, so that was a great point we made. We were like ready to go. We were done. And then in closing, she shows a slide and says, oh, Mr. Reichel and his, you know, scientific evidence. Well, in reality, the height of the bunk was only this much, so Isaiah couldn't have reached. And so we go home that night. We're staying in the same house. Up there, and I said, well, how did we miss that? And John says, we didn't miss it, you idiot. She's, she put in the wrong evidence. And I said, no, no one would do that. <coughs> he said, yeah. So I, I she, me- she measured the back. She, she, she introduced an exhibit which was the back of the bunk, which was much lower. He said the front of the bunk is like 18 inches higher. So you don't roll out onto the floor. Yeah, yeah, so you don't roll out on the floor. So I, I come in the next morning. I say, Your Honor, um, you know, we're about to begin the defense closing argument. But before we do, I, I'm a little perplexed. The people's closing yesterday, which they went on for two hours, and then we went home for the night. They said that, well, you know, their whole theory about him not being able to reach is beaten by the fact that the bunk bed is down here. And so, I, and, you know, I said, but, you know, last night we figured out that it wasn't down here. It was up here. Okay. So if it was up here, that's not fair that she did. And she looks at just, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. He's right. I made a mistake. Your Honor. I'm sorry. He's right. I made a mistake. Come on. You know, just so you know, you know, when you prepare a closing argument in a murder case, you're doing it for about at least a month beforehand. So to come up at, at that, you know, when you close, she literally thought we wouldn't figure that out. I thought it was a search for the truth. It was not a contest to win at all costs. Because if it's a contest to win at all costs, they're the ones that have all the, they have, they're the ones who set the board game out and put the pieces on the board. Okay. They're the bank in Monopoly. And so when, when they, you know, don't see it as, as a search for the truth, but a win at all costs, you ain't winning, man. And that's the kind of thing where, again, if had a jury been sitting there, the jury would have remembered yeah. that. Uh, yeah, in, yeah. In closing, I would have said just so, what I just told you. I mean, come on, Phil. If you're a juror, and I say, "Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you know this is a big, how high-profile murder case." She's had three years to get together. We've been together here trying this case for six weeks, folks. All right. You remember on day 27 when we put in the evidence of the height of the bunk and length of my guy's arm and everything? Well, you saw her yesterday. What did she put in? She prepared this. It's not like she just added a slide to her closing argument. You, you prepare this. Okay, and she put in a slide and said, well, Isaiah could have stabbed him, her, because he was this tall and the bunk was only this big. So Mr. Reichel's wrong. And what'd she do for that? She put in the wrong slide of the back of the bunk. What does that mean, folks? Can I tell you something? When somebody does that to you, it means they know they lose. Okay, that's what we call when I was a kid, we used to call cheating. It's a conspiracy when you have more than one person, cons- you know, conspiring to uh, commit a crime. Yeah, uh-huh. it, it, it reminds me of organized crime, basically, at a certain level. This is, you know, these are 
the the administrators of ju- administrators of justice and it, they're behaving like organized criminals here because right. they're together to put a twelve year old away. If you're a judge, what would you say when I say, "Hey, Your Honor, that ain't fair"? Come on, man. Mistrial. You know. Or, you know. or if, you're the, if you're the trier of fact, if you're the jury, what do you say? She's got to lie because she's got to lie. Yeah, the, well, the, the fact is she already got to say that in front of everybody and get everybody emotionally, you know, geared in one direction. And then it's, like, oh, I'm sorry, that's it. It's almost like a retraction at the back page of a newspaper after blasting somebody in the front page. Remember, there ain't, there's no jury. There's no jury. Oh. Yeah. So I said, so I'd ask you, Your Honor, to realize I accept her, I accept her apology and I accept her that she's made a mistake. But I want you to realize how significant that mistake is, Your Honor, when you issue your ruling about guilt or innocence. Because there's no jury. The judge is the jury. That's what I would say. If, if the jury had heard all of this and that kind of thing during the closing, right? We think we would have walked out of there with Isaiah with us. This whole thing seems rotten. How, how old is Isaiah now? Is he 19? 19, I think. He may have just turned 20. Yeah, so he, he was 12 in 2013, well, I guess. He turned, he turned 13, 13 in, in 2013. And 13 in August. So he was born in, he was born in obviously uh, 20, in August of 20. So he's, he's, he's 20 now. Yeah. So is it 23 or 25 that he's supposed to be released? Well, that's another issue. Go ahead, Mark. That's, that's a good question. One. So we, we, uh, we appealed the first conviction and said that, Confession was horrid and shouldn't have come in. And the appellate court said, we agree. We don't need to get into anything else. We agree the, the statement, not the confession, but the statements he made shouldn't have been considered by the judge. So they sent it back out for a retrial. So we retried it. And the retrial was, you know, the retrial, let's just call it what it is. The retrial was a farce. And the judge there was like, you know, look, he's already been convicted. She basically said he's already been convicted, right? But they, they want to throw out the statement. All right, well, I'll give you another trial. So she sat there. I think she was doing crossword puzzles, and, and I think she had her computer up, and she was playing solitaire. Because at one point I said, you ought to play the five. Put the black five on the red four. Anyway, sorry, Your Honor. And so so she sits there, and at the end she says, okay, I want to convict him. And I said, okay, she goes, can I just sentence him right now to the same time you already got? Can I give him the same sentence? I said, no. You know, I want to come back and make an argument to, hey, man, let him out earlier, whatever. And she said, okay, all right. Plus we needed a probation report. Yeah, we needed a probation report as well to give him credits for the time served. And he would, he had been down in a, in a prison elsewhere for youth, youth and juvenile, far from his family. But this was close to his family. So he said, hey, if you continue the sentencing for you know a minute here, I can visit with my family. Okay, let's do that. So we come back, and when we appear, she says, are you aware that you know, I found him guilty on whatever May, May something or June. And you've continued the sentencing to the middle of July. And I said, yeah, well, we're here for sentence. He says, just so you know, on July 1st, effective July 1st of this year, there's a new law in California. The juveniles can't be held just to 23. We can hold them to 25. So by appealing and winning, coming back and retrying it, and then extending the sentencing out, it's now effective July 1 of, of this year, of 2017, I can now hold him to 25 instead of 23. So I'm going to hold him to 25 and 23. And he looks at me and says, why the fuck did you appeal? You just gave me two years on top and I'm innocent. Now, the interesting thing is in the second appeal, that was one of the issues raised was to, at the very least, roll back his sentence to the 23 year mark. And what do you think about that? And the court and the appellate court wouldn't allow it, despite the fact that the attorney general's own attorneys asked the appellate court That's to right. roll it back to 23. So, so he gets sentenced to, 20, to age 25 instead of 23. He gets two years thrown on top. And he says, Mark, with all due respect, why did you appeal? You just keep messing my life up, buddy. So we said, well, we're going to appeal this now. And so we appeal the second trial. So it goes up on appeal about whether he's innocent or not, right? And the second issue is, hey, it ain't fair to give a guy 25 when he was supposed to release at 23. So the judges on the appellate court said, well, let's let's deal with number one, let's deal with the guilt or innocence appeal. And they're talking about it. And then they say, now let's get to the issue here in this oral argument of this appeal and this 
fine and regal and handsome courtroom here about whether the law allows him to be held at 25 or 23. And the attorney general, who is the prosecutor, remember, we're on the other side. It's an adversarial system, and we believe that it works best if one side has is, is got their point, the other guy's got his point, they're going at it real hard. It's called the adversarial system. So in this time, the attorney general lined up with us and said, Your Honor, I don't think you can hold it. Appellate court, I don't think you can hold the 25. I think that was an error. I think he's got to be held at 23. We actually agree with Mr. Reigel for the first time in recorded history. <laughs> the appellate court said he shall be held until he's 25. I'm sorry to ruin your night, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, uh... So awful, awful story. That's we've been doing it for seven years for free. Seven years. God bless both of you. One more time for free. It's amazing. But it's not just our time for free. If a witness or a photocopy or whatever or a hotel or whatever, this comes out of our personal money. Wow. But I do it a hundred times over, and he'd do it a thousand times over. Every morning, he wakes to give up. you an idea. Yeah. I start my day, I go to the computer, I have my coffee and my oatmeal, and uh, yeah. I pull up the arrest records for Calaveras County from the previous day, for Tuolumne County, for Amador County, and I look for anyone who might possibly fit the description. All right. And I keep a list. Plus, you know, we've gotten, we've gotten some incredibly, this is sound almost redundant, incredibly credible. Yeah. Uh, tips as to possible killers, including a woman who was in a rehab yeah. setting in Calaveras County after the time of the murder and said to other members of the rehab, you know, my boyfriend killed that little girl and I helped him get rid of the weapon. And unfortunately, in a way, he was in incarcerated in county jail at the time for a violent act crime. He is a registered sex offender. They swabbed him for DNA. It doesn't happen to match the DNA on the label. But nevertheless, you know, we don't have the funds to completely pursue that. And we can't put people in jeopardy who are living with him now. Because that woman, this is how people's minds work. That woman who complained about this and also complained about him molesting her children, still lives with him. That's disgusting. All right, let me give you one last, I'm, I'm, I'll do this in 90 seconds, because okay. it's so simple, okay? So the, the father, Barney, that's his real daughter, obviously, that's his daughter, it's not stepdaughter, and Isaiah's his real son, all right? And so Barney is the father, and no one knows this, this is not public information, this is in the internal discovery that we're not allowed to give out. Should I, so, should I mute this from the podcast? No, I want you to no, no problem at all. Okay. Ready? All right. So Barney comes running up, you know, that day, grabs the, his daughter, he comes running out. The cops come up, the ambulance comes up, they go to the hospital. So then they go back to the house and they're trying to figure out what to do. The cops say, you can't come in the house. It's a crime scene, whatever. So this is around six o'clock at night. They, they're still at the hospital. Then Isaiah goes and gets questioned. So the next morning, about 830, the next morning, Sunday morning, uh, about uh, 17, 18 hours after the murder. So he goes Sunday morning, sits down with the cops. They put on a video camera and they videotape him. And he says, look, I, you're the cops. You're going to help me find the murder of my daughter. You know, so I got to be honest with you guys. I spent many years, okay, slinging methamphetamine down a stock, big time, with the Mexican mafia. And they said, well, how big? He says, about a half a million dollars every six months. They say, okay. And he said, and then we had a problem, okay? We had a problem. <laughs> then what was the problem? Well, they say I ripped them off, I took some money or took some drugs, and it was a bad deal. So we moved from Stockton, and I moved up here to Valley Springs. And since you're the cops, you're going to help find the murder of my daughter, I want you to know everything. I got, I'm got. i not hiding anything from you. I want to be honest. They said, okay, well, we're videotaping this. Yeah, that's okay. He said, so, you know, I had this Mexican mafia issue where I was doing a lot of methamphetamine for them. I was moving it. I was their guy. And then it went bad. And I just said, hey, I'm getting out of here and move my family to Valley Springs. So I don't know if that was involved in this or not. And they said, Mr. Fowler, thank you very much for your honesty. You know, we'll put that, we'll, we'll work on that as well. And that's never been public, ever, anywhere. And that relates to what I told you earlier. That's what I get to. So so we, he, gets a, he gets a letter about six months ago from a guy 
who says, Mr. Kennedy, I've read about you. I know you're working on this case. I'm from Stockton. I'm serving federal time. I'm going to go off and do 15 years federally or whatever. And I just can't live with myself if I don't tell you the following. Back when this happened, uh, I had heard about it from some guys who said that Mr. Fowler had ripped off the Mexican mafia. Okay. So they said, you know, we did his, we did his daughter because he ripped us off. So we went to go interview this guy. And this guy who gives us dates and times and names and numbers and everybody. And he is to the, and he doesn't know, I mean, he doesn't know that, that Mr. Fowler went in and told the police officers this. He doesn't know this at all. That wasn't, no one knows that. No one knows that. And so we never talked about it. It's never the trial. None of that stuff. So what's the, what's the odds of that? So we went and, you know, kind of tried to prove up what this guy said. He said, hey, you know, look, I talked to these guys. These are their names. So he went because he's the investigator. So he does the he finds the people on Lexus and addresses and phone numbers and all that stuff. And he finds everything this guy said is true. This guy lived here. This guy lived here. This guy got convicted for the Mexican mafia. And this guy got convicted of this. He puts it all together. Everything this man told us is true. And um, and uh, everything he told us was true. We'll leave it at that. It certainly appears to be, and he's not the only one. Yeah. But I was never, and the police knew about it at the time. They got a tip from Stockton before our this new tip. Yeah. They got a tip saying the exact same thing. And our guy, our new tipster, could not have known that. So if you were the jury, and we said, look, here's the rule of law in America that you must follow, whether you like it or not, okay, it's above your pay grade. The rule of law is, you have to be, on, be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that this young man did this crime exactly as they say he did and how he did it and when he did it. Okay. You, you have to be con as convinced beyond a reasonable doubt as you would anything that matters significantly in your life. I'm not convinced. That you'd, be married, you'd be married to that opinion for the rest of your days. I'm not, conv I'm not convinced. Like, I couldn't sleep at night making the decision that, that, uh, that a 12-year-old boy murdered his 8-year-old sister and cleaned up the the mess and there's and there's no dna between the murder scene and the bathroom where the cleanup i mean just the trail there's between no, no, there's no cleanup scene just so you know yeah there's no not, there, there's no link because there is no link yeah the, the whole thing doesn't make sense and then the idea of oh him lying to, to that he chased the, well who's to say that he didn't at least run to the front door my, I think he said in the bathroom and just kept the door locked even until he looked out. Even if he put, even if, I mean, they said he had a baseball, but even if he, you know, I'm just well, saying. he didn't have a baseball bat. When his dad got there and the cops got there. And the cops got there because his dad told him to go outside and grab the baseball bat. In front oh, of him. okay. Right. And then. After the intruder after, was after gone. After the intruder was there. In case the guy was still around. You know, Phil, it didn't take much. You know, I've raised two boys and I was a boy. He opened the door. And he saw what's going on in the back in the bedroom, and that was nothing he wanted to be participating in. So he, he closed the door for a minute to figure out what he's gonna do because you know, hey man, you know, I'm not really Superman, I gotta figure this out here. Yeah. And it doesn't give you much time. But when he says I saw him hitting Layla, that's you know, that's perfect. And then yeah, I think he sees it, he closes the door, and then you know, he's happy because he hears a band running out of the house. And he thinks, okay, the coast is clear, I'm gonna come out. But then everybody shows up and they say, Well, what'd you do? Hide in the bathroom like a coward? No, I uh, I chased him out. I chased him out like a brave man. Well, if you'd have told him, hey, by the way, if you're going to stick with that story, you're going to prison. The 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 father. I mean, the father doesn't sound like. I don't want to insult the man, but I mean, I I personally wouldn't let my kid or even myself. I just wouldn't talk to the police without an attorney present. And the fact that he allowed his son to be questioned like this. Um, it, extremely poor judgment, to say the least. He, he doesn't sleep at night because of it, too. He loves. Uh, and, and you have you have a relatively, um, relatively unique case in which he's the father of the victim as well yes. as a suspect. So the conflict is just. So too there's much. an incredible conflict going on for him in the situation as well. And he also didn't think his boy did it and, until and that he, day. They convinced him in that final, the first several interviews, his son didn't do it. But that last one, when they said, because, you know, as you, you may or may not know, but, you know, it's legal for them to lie to, to get a confession. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so dad shows up because he's got the daughter. He wants to hear what the facts are. And they say, hey, just so you know, 
we canvassed the neighborhood and no one saw anything what your son says. In reality, someone saw exactly what your son says. But anyway, and we also did this and this, and then we've got some DNA evidence that's going to link your boy. And then we've got this science that links your boy. And then we've also got some satellite evidence that links your boy. And you know, you're, you're, you're shaking the boots because it's your daughter. Well, plus, it's going back to the 911 call, in that final interview with Isaiah, with the, his dad present pressing him, there was an FBI agent pressing him, and there was a county detective pressing him, all jointly. And the FBI agent was saying, listen, we've analyzed the 911 call yes. with this great new research and science that we have. Yes. And it can tell it tells that if you're, you're lying. guilty or not. It We're tells if you're lying. guilty or not. If it's a guilty or not phone call, okay? Because we get a lot of these 911 calls. So we fed this dad in that whole scientific computer world we got. And I got news for you. That 911 call came back with, and the dad says, well, dad has a high school education. And he says, wow, well, I want to thank you guys for working so hard on this for my daughter, you know. But, you know, okay, if you're telling me that my boy did it, I guess, you know, I mean, I, I'm convinced that he didn't, but you, you're the experts. So he says to the son, son, you got to listen to these guys. They got you. They got you boxed in here. So we need to get out of this by saying you're sick. Uh. He says, listen, Isaiah, if you did it, tell me. I'm still going to love you. Yes. And that's when Isaiah said, well, maybe, but I don't remember. <laughs> but if you at tell that me. Point, at that point, Barney believes him. Yeah. And he cuts off the interview. Yeah. But the... The FBI, the database of people they use for their research on 911 calls, stopped. The youngest was age 19. And those calls were direct first calls to 911 yeah. versus yeah. someone who was 12 calling their parents and having the parents call him and then have 911 call, yeah. excuse me, 911 call. So it was. It wasn't going to stand a trial. They never introduced it. Yeah, so, you know, they never introduced it. They used it to get the confession. But they told us they were going to use it at trial. They marked it as an exhibit. And I filed a motion. And I said, look, I hope that you pin your case. <laughs> I hope you pin your case on some experts to take the stand and say, I'm an expert. I listened to that call. And that's a guilty phone call. If that's your evidence, I can't wait for that. And even as bad as the judge that we had, they withdrew their motion and said, we're not going to use it because there's it's junk science. It's completely junk. It's, it's crap science to say that's a guilt, guilty phone call. They also did testing on screams from the bedroom to see how far the screams would carry. And they all, they barely carried into the front yard. Yeah. So the, the idea that everyone said, well, we didn't hear anything. None of the neighbors heard anything. Yeah. Was they never introduced that evidence either. And everyone they brought in, we were able to say, well, you weren't actually looking at the house at the time, were you? Well, no, I was on the exercise machine. Or I was running the lawnmower, you know, three houses down the street. Or, you know, one guy said, I never saw anybody run away from the house, which, by the way, included his own nephew who was with the family, yeah. who ran right past him while he was working on a yard nearby. He didn't see him either. So the idea, and then... Within a year, there were two stabbing murders in Lodi, and in both cases, none of the neighbors saw or heard anything, and it was the same two guys. Now, so the long and the short of it, we was robbed. <laughs> Absolutely, this, this sounds like a like a Megan's Law, you know, type case. You know, the, the girls in her bedroom, guy comes in, and kills, walks out, kind of scenario. Like it's simple, but yet they go for the easiest you know another victim basically <laughs> that's the da of calaveras county and that's how they run it right now I'm not saying it's always going to be that way but sure how else he runs it and, and, and as i and as i say in in so in an effort to be somewhat fair to the da i'm gonna leave the room he's gonna do that <laughs> <laughs> but initially it was a reasonable thing to think that isaiah was involved yeah i agree that, that was not unreasonable. But then the evidence, the science came right. in. The science, when the, because look, they, they said, look, we want to continue this so the FBI can analyze all the traps because we know the boy cleaned up. And there's, yeah. and, and you know, come on, 12 year old, there's going to be blood. There's going to be crap in that. There's going to be blood in those traps. So they said, sure. So we kicked it six months, kicked it six months, and an FBI report came back and said, 
there's nothing in those traps. There's nothing in, when I say traps, I want you to know, I mean the pipes underneath, you know, the, the elbow pipes, the 90 pipes. So the FBI report came back with zero evidence that the kid did it. And, you know, that's when I, yeah, that's when you both said, hey man, to the DA, well, you should hold off a minute here, girl. Because, you know, honestly, you know, we were with you on this guy may have done it, man. But now we're like, what the hell? What, where, where, how are you going to prove he did it? Other than you want him to have done it. And then you ever, you ever ask a 12 year old to clean his bedroom? Yeah, then when you bring in the real home run stuff about the unidentified DNA and everything, it's like, okay, well, what are we doing this for? Travesty of justice. Uh, I'm surprised this isn't in the innocence files. Uh, you know, like somebody hasn't done a documentary about this because it's just this case just reeks of it. Well, Phil, if you if you do do it, I mean, remember we we need to do a you know a little contract, buddy. <laughs> and yeah. we, don't worry, we can cut David out. I mean, if you look at <laughs> you don't get a bite out of this at all anymore. We lost him. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. I'm gonna I'm gonna delete his contact on my phone too. So when he sued, he goes, "Where are you?" Like, there you go, <laughs> Dave. Who? Yeah. Dave yeah. All right. Well, that's. I think there's probably more that we would could tell you, but actually, Chris. Uh, what's Chris's name? Chris. Chris, the neighbor. Oh, I didn't want to use his name. Ah, damn. Chris, what's his name? Chris Butler. That there's this another one that would just make you. He was telling about the the house next door that's empty or whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The guy that lost his oh, lost his shirt because we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something. There's no way that guy wasn't involved in some way. Honestly, he, at the very least, I firmly believe he knows more than he yeah. ever tell us. Yeah. And crazy stuff. And somehow, that's the only thing that could explain why the DA goes out, leaves the courtroom to talk to him afterwards. And he gets in her face and is yelling at her and screaming at her, and she's backed up against the wall, and he is this close to her face. It's an assault. I mean, it's just. I mean, I've never seen somebody attack a DA like this, a big male and a female DA in a trial. And he's yelling at her like this. And she's going, I'm sorry. And it's his wife that testified, not him. You understand? And we didn't pin it on him. We just said she's a liar. No, we didn't even say she's a liar. We liked her testimony because she said she's mowing the lawn and she didn't hear any screaming and she didn't see anybody running down there. I said, great. And the DA was trying to use that to say, hey, there's no way this boy's story about an intruder would work. But she testifies that she's mowing the lawn and she's got the dog out there and she doesn't hear or see anything. So we thought, what the hell? Let's do it. The so, only thing Mark did was he asked her yeah. if she was cohabitated with Chris Butler. She said yes. And and he's the caretaker of the empty house next to you, correct? For the bank? And she said, no. And at that point, as Mark said, he had what we needed. There yeah. was no reason. But we had asked her, look, so you're the big witness with the DA, but your dogs, how would you know if your dogs are barking or not if you're mowing the lawn? Okay. And then I showed her the people's, the people's evidence, the people's exhibit. I showed her her house and their house. I said, can you do me a favor? Can you tell me how you can see that house from your house? I can't. Yeah, I agree. You can't. So you can't see their house. How far are you? You're half a mile down the road. Okay. And you're mowing the lawn? Is that right? Yes, I was mowing the lawn. Okay. And you don't happen to see any murder running by saying I just killed a little girl. No, I haven't, sir. I understand. That, and that's reasonable if you man. And their claim was if someone had run past their house or what have you, the dogs would have been barking. Yeah. And then it occurred to me, way too late. I wish this bulb had gone off earlier. Unless, of course, they you know. know the person. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll let you go, uh, Phil. Yeah, it's been a long night, guys, but I, I really appreciate your time. Fantastic story. And uh, I, I really hope Isaiah is able to get justice before he reaches 25. So, yeah, so Max, uh, you know, cut this up and look at it and let us know if you have any questions. I definitely will. Thank you again for your time this evening. You're welcome. Thank you. Great t-shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> we'll keep in touch, Phil. All right. Have a great night. Take care.